Let's welcome in our co-host and lone co-host on the day today. He is the social assassin, New York Times best-selling author, John Gilstrap. Johnny? Good morning. Uh, somebody didn't get the whole it's springtime memo. It's cold out there. It is cold out there. I mean, it's beyond cold because you're not used to it now. you got a little tease of spring. So yeah, you walk out like, 19 degree wind chill. Yeah, yeah. Or it was, less. Well, it was 23 on the thermometer, so it's so cold. You're probably more in the mid teens in the country where you are, right? right? Mm -hmm. The temperatures I get in the morning are, I think, airport temperatures. You're a little further out where it's a lot more rural. And we leave the windows open at night. Which is not a good move when you have a, a mid teens wind chill overnight. You yeah. didn't leave them open last night, did you? I did. I did. That's not, it was, it was, that's what, you know, we have this big comforter. You know, so, water pipes are going to break. No, no. Oh, yeah. No. no we, have, we have well insulated walls. One day, when you are skating, when you wake up in the winter, <laughs> you'll say, you know, that we don't have the, We don't have water pipes on the exterior walls. Doesn't matter. The cold air gets inside the walls. Oh, does it? Sure. Okay. That's how water pipes freeze. Nobody has water pipes on the outside of their house. The no, you don't on have the them inside. on exterior walls. You have them on interior walls. That's, you don't, no. You design, you design the house so that you don't have the water pipes freeze. You got to bring the, that the water interior, in from the outside, don't the, you? The interior temp the, uh, of the the interior temperature of my house this morning when I got up was fifty eight. That was the temperature in the bedroom. Hey, if you look on our uh, three shot there, you'll see a QR code, and that is for the NCAA tournament, which uh, I guess in earnest today will begin with the field of sixty four. If you if, uh, get your uh, phone out and scan that link, it'll take you to our NCAA tournament bracket where you can play. And if you are one of the top four, you'll get a $25 gift certificate to Mother Shucker's restaurant. And uh, number one overall gets a trophy, uh, which is going to be constructed by our former Honest Donna out front, who now is uh, running her own business with Trophies Plus. Also, my Dukes, if you see the sweatshirt here, my Duquesne Dukes for the first time since 1977 are in the NCAA tournament. They play uh, today at 1240 against BYU. So that's why you see this this uh, hoodie that I'm wearing. And this was my actual hoodie from uh, football my freshman year at Duquesne University in 1981. It's in pretty good shape, don't you think, Gilstrap? I do. I mean, the colors are still bright. This could be a detergent commercial yeah. you know, after, after low these many years. Yeah, it's hanging on a hanger. I don't wear it too often. Yeah. But this is a 43-year-old hoodie. No visible beer stains from the college years? We had, I had a blue and a white. The white one doesn't look as good as the blue. I must have had more fun on the white one. <laughs> Our first guest is Amy Serba. She is Regional Director of Children's Home Society. Amy, welcome. Good morning. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. It's really fun to enjoy this banter live for once in the actual studio. For once? Oh, that must mean you must listen every now and then. I do. I do listen, yes, occasionally. I plug it in on my... Uh, morning routine, getting ready for work, and it's nice to be here in the studio with you. So thank you so much for having me. John, I told you we had a listener. It's exactly the right thing to say. You <laughs> thought we were doing this show for ourselves. <laughs> I told you there was a listener out I, there. Okay. There right. she is. Yeah, I'll give you the dollar after there the she, show. We should get a you trophy win. from Donna for too. Uh, how long have you been with Children's Home Society? I have been officially with Children's Home Society since 2015. Mm -hmm. I started at Victoria's House Child Advocacy Center. Um, then it was Safe Haven Child Advocacy Center. But the cool thing is I was actually a team member um, with Victoria's House as an investigative team member um, since 2011. So my heart has been with Children's Home Society since I started my career in child welfare. I've just been officially an employee since 2015. And in my position as regional director, this is, um, I've just pumped over my first year of that. Oh, so congratulations. Thank you. And yes. your office is in Martinsburg? It is. We have three actual locations in Martinsburg. Um, our main location is 100 South Queen Street, right across from uh, Blue White Grill in Diagonal from Habaneros. Okay. And you are from Morgan County. I am. Is there a Morgan County office for Children's Home Society? There is not. We still serve Morgan County. We serve all areas of the Eastern Panhandle. Um, we just don't have a physical location out there. When you say all areas, do you mean the three counties of the Eastern Panhandle or the greater, longer Eastern Panhandle? Um, we serve the greater, longer area. So we Children's Home Society is a nonprofit that serves the entire state of West Virginia. So mm -hmm. we have um, 13 primary locations, but actually 28 physical locations all across the state. So okay. Um, we try to cover every county in West Virginia as best we can. Um, so our next closest site is Romney, um, and we have an office out there. And this is your very first radio appearance? It is. Well, welcome. Thank you. Congratulations. You're doing great, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. What is the mission of the Children's Home Society? So our mission is to promote the well-being of children. 
sounds simple and it is simple. That's what we do day in and day out. Um, that's what we strive to do. Everything that we do that comes across our desk, um, that is what we come back to. Will it promote the well-being of children? And how do you actually do that in earnest? So we have um, seven local programs here in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, one of our biggest programs is our foster care program. Um, in our foster care program, it is what it sounds like. We bring in um, children who have been displaced from their biological homes or their kinship relative homes who need safe and stable housing um, while their families work on reunification. Um, so we license those foster families, we go out, recruit them, we find them, um, walk them through that licensing process, which does take a little bit of time. Um, we wanna make sure that their homes are appropriate, that they're ready and prepared to take on children who have experienced trauma. Um, we then, once we place a child in their home, we case manage that, that case for the Department of Human Services. Um, so that can mean anything from meeting with that child weekly up to at minimum two times uh, a month in their home, depending on what their need is. So our social workers are going into the home, they're meeting with them in the home, they're referring them to services, uh, making sure that everything in between their needs are met. It can be basic needs, um, clothing needs, it can be um, making sure that their doctor's appointments are made, whatever it might be, including um, kind of the next step of foster care, which is providing that supervised visitation for biological parents and their children in that time when they spend apart. Um, so that's kind of the foster care service in mm -hmm. a nutshell that we provide. Um, some other services that our area provides, that our site provides here in Martinsburg, is our Victoria's House Child Advocacy Center. Um, that supports the investigation process of serious abuse and neglect allegations. Um, so we uh, provide interviewing services and advocacy services to families who are going through that investigation process. We work with all um, local law enforcement agencies in the Eastern Panhandle, including some federal ones, um, as well as with Child Protective Service agents in the prosecuting attorney's office. Um, we also have wraparound services that we provide. So that's more of a program for our older youth who are struggling to um, kind of just cope with, with skills or cope with things that they're facing every day in life. Our social workers go into the home weekly and work with the youth and work with their family to kind of um, come to one table and try new things. Um, we strive to work together so that the youth can succeed in their home rather than facing placement outside of the home. Um, other services that we offer, we have mental health program um, where we're offering therapy services to our clients. And then two of our newest programs um, are located here in Berkeley County and over in Jefferson County. And that's our Monarch Family Support Center and our Honeybee Family Support Center. So our family support centers are um, grant programs with the Department of Human Services. And those programs um, really work with families to provide any need that they have. So our biggest component right now that we've seen the most success with, we're in our first and second year of those programs, is our parenting services. So we offer a parenting class to anybody who wants to take it. Um, our staff- You don't have to be in the foster care uh, system to take it? Nope, the only qualification is that you are a parent who wants services. Um, so we offer that program, it's the Nurturing Parent Curriculum. Um, it's a nine-week program right now. You come in, we offer child care while you're taking your parenting classes, we provide a meal for you and your kiddos, um, and it's kind of like a group facilitated uh, program. So there's also a parent support group component that comes with it. Um, the social workers in that program do a phenomenal job. We have a um, a family support center assistant in both locations who do phenomenal jobs. They're also doing parent engagement activities regularly. And then in the, in the wrong run, they're working with families to do an intake where they're identifying goals that families have to help them meet um, whatever goals they have to be successful. So it can be budgeting, it can be career placement, and we're working with all of the community providers to help them um, bring it all to one table so it's, it's easy to navigate for them. Um, you know, a lot of times our families will go to um, one service provider and they're like, well, we need to refer you to X, Y, and Z, or you need to go here and there and everywhere. Our Family Support Center social workers are bringing that all to one table so that it's manageable for them. How has the split up of DHHR into three distinct and unique organizations affected what you do, if it has at all? So it hasn't really affected what we do. We just kind of navigate as we can. Um, and we are... Has it made it more efficient to navigate? Um, sort of. So 
our foster care program and our Monarch Family Support Center are two great ways to explain the differences in that because the Monarch Family Support Center certainly goes to the family aid side of the split with DHS. And then our foster care program obviously goes under the DHS side. Um, so we are looking at components from both of those. For us in the service um, component, it hasn't really changed a lot of what we do. We are used to kind of changes that come at us, so we just go with the flow. Um, and and that's how we how we roll with it. Um, so we haven't seen a lot of, of changes of how the service provision happens. Um, you know, one thing that I wanted to talk about today and one thing that is changing is um, our foster care program as a child placing agency, we do have challenges with that. Um, we haven't received a rate increase in, in a little bit, and that's one thing that we asked for in this last session with, with legislators that we didn't get. So um, with the governor um, likely calling back in the special session, you know, that is an increase that we're asking for that we do need. What do you, what do you get and what are you looking for? So we, um, I, I'm honestly, I'm not sure what the current rate is. We are asking for a 25% increase and that would allow us to go from a 4% um, to a 9% of what we're paying our foster families to take care of the children who are in foster care currently, as well as allow our agencies to kind of release the burden that we're experiencing of licensing families, of paying our staff, paying our wages, and also overcoming the increases that we've experienced. Um, just in this last year alone, child placing agencies have experienced, you know, costs that any other agency has experienced in liability insurance and in benefits packages and in salaries. So without kind of a leveled increase or any increase at all in what the rate that we're getting from DHS to provide to our families and to provide for those clients, it has really placed us in a pickle. Um, West Virginia has already lost one child placing agency, and the fear is that, um, you know, if something doesn't happen at the state level, more child placing agencies could have to make those decisions. Currently, child placing agencies are faced with the, the fear of having to lay staff off, um, which in turn um, impacts the number of clients that we can place in foster care. If we don't have staff who can case manage those cases, then we can't take those kids into our homes. Um, additionally, you know, recruitment for foster families um, it takes a lot of staff effort. Um, when you have a home finder, which is the role of who is going out to license those families, who now has to carry a caseload because we don't have staff to go in to case manage those um, kiddos' cases and meet their needs and meet the needs of our foster families, that kind of takes away from the recruitment efforts that we can do. Um, so it is all kind of a balancing act that we have to do, and it all goes back to that increase that we need mm -hmm. um, to be able to afford to open families that are going to be safe for our kids um, and can care for these kids until the court determines that it's safe for them to go back to their homes. John? I think among the tragedies of, of foster care and the, the needs for foster care is that it, it trades one form of trauma for another form of trauma, right? The, the, the idea of being taking a kid from a, a biological home into a foster home is in itself a form of trauma. Yesterday we had Delegate uh, uh, Burkhammer on the show. And was it his, uh, I, I forget which county he was talking about, where 44% of the minor children in the county, 44% of the children were in homes that were not their own. They had been relocated in, into foster homes. Now for me, um, as my background is, is a safety engineer, to me, that number rings a different bell. And I'm, I'm thinking perhaps, perhaps we need to look at the standards by which we are judging the need for foster care. And is that possible? I don't know, I, but is it possible that we have, we're pulling kids out too early, that we're, that we're judging, we're judging the level of harm too harshly, that perhaps we should allow them to stay when we're not allowing them to stay, you know what I mean? And, and allowing them to endure whatever that trauma is at home, it shouldn't be any, but that's better than the next trauma. Have, is, do we look at that at all? So I think that that's a really tough question. I think it's a good perspective to have. And um, respectfully, I think that that's a really fair question for people who don't work in the field to have. 
Um, Fair enough. And I think whenever you're not interacting with children or interacting with families who um, are experiencing child abuse or experiencing challenges um, that result in removal of children, that that's a question to ask. And one thing that we can't do is ever kind of violate the state code or that CPS policy that's in place that um, that our CPS workers follow to make that decision when the safe when the home is not safe to make that removal. Is removal a judgment call or is it a is it a is it based on very specific criteria? So if if you meet these this criteria, then removal is necessary. Or is is it is it the feeling of of would would every um, social worker who visits this house draw the same conclusion that the child needs to be removed? So it's both. Um, so there is very specific criteria, and then there's checks and balances in place for that criteria. So the social worker that's assessing that home, and I'm not a CPS worker, so mm -hmm. this is just from my experience working in child welfare, um, but the criteria that's in place, they uh, do their assessment. If it meets the criteria, they assess with their supervisor. And then the next level of checks and balances is they have to take that to a judge who's then um, providing that order to remove that child and put that child in, in state custody. And, you know, the other thing that, and I'm not sure which county that, sorry, I, I just uh, He was from Lewis County. That's okay. Don't Lewis worry about County. That. So yeah. I'm not sure what that um, rate of foster care versus um, kinship relative care is, but currently there's over 6,000 children in state custody, in DHHR custody, or DHS custody, excuse me, the name change is still getting me. Right. me um, but 27% are actually only in foster care. So we are one of the states that have the highest level of children in kinship relative care. Um, so it is, a, it is traumatic. Which would be grandparents raising grandchildren. It can that, be grandparents, right. aunts and uncles. It can be even teachers or a, a coach, anybody that is a fictive kin relative to. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's fair to say that when you do remove a child from their biological family, that is another trauma that they experience. However, I do think that one thing that our state does is really follow that criteria well to say, what services can we put in place before we have to go to a removal? Um, unfortunately, specific to the Eastern Panhandle, we see a lot of poly victimization where we're not looking at homes um, where parents are, are dealing with one class of victimization. There's domestic violence and there's substance abuse, or there's physical abuse and substance abuse. You know, the opioid epidemic has really inflicted on um, traumatizing and abusing our kids as well that has trickled down to result in the abuse that they're experiencing too um, and i think that that is really where we are in this crisis of so many kids needing to be out of their natural home and i want to make it clear nowhere in that question was there a veiled accusation i just want to want to know if, if people are looking at that because that's, that's just a such a startling number yeah yeah and i think it's a fair question and i think it's one that we should be asking um, but from my perspective and my experience, you know, I think that in specific to the Eastern Panhandle, our um, Child Protective Services workers do a phenomenal job of trying to put services in place when they can to prevent that removal. Um, and that is the statutory requirement. All reasonable efforts are made to prevent that removal. And, and perhaps this is what one of the things that your, your program does. Um, the teen years for you know the traditional family people who come up through through normal families um, you you ease your kids up to adulthood and then you sort of launch them you know from the nests <laughs> sometimes the launch is slower than others right but um, but in foster care as I understand it it's 18 and out right and and is, what is are there programs specifically built for what to do in the when they're 19 and they're done with the program and they're adults and they're on their own? There are. So, um, and a lot of our foster families have, um, you know, this, those kiddos become part of their family. So it's just like when it's your 18 year old and out, they go off to college or they go to work and then they're bringing their grandbabies back. Um, we have one family here in the Eastern Panhandle there. Um, their kiddo was placed with them when they were 12. They just graduated from Marshall University. They have a social work degree now and they're coming back. Um, and I believe getting married this spring. Um, so, you know, they, our foster families, um, when reunification is not possible, they do become adoptive families. And those kids 
um, do become part of their natural families. When that doesn't work, when they don't find their forever home, um, we have an independent living program um, that we is brand new this year. We have two youth currently in that where they um, are 18 years old. They grew up in foster care. Um, they went in and out of residential care, and now they're living in their very first apartments. They get a case manager every week who's checking in with them, making sure that they're taking out the trash, helping them develop those life skills that they didn't get that you would get in growing up in a family home or growing up learning how to live independently in that nature. Um, and they're learning those skills. They're learning how to um, apply for jobs, how to develop a resume, and kind of how to live independently. And that program's offered up until they're 25 years of age. Um, in addition to that, they are required to either volunteer or work 40 hours a week so that they're getting that experience too. Um, and then on the flip side of that, we do have a program for youth who want to go to college in the Modify program. Um, and that helps youth uh, transition when they're 18 from high school into a college if they want to go into that route as well. So there are programs for um, youth who are aging out of foster care um, who do not have adoptive or forever homes. Amy Serba is our guest. If you're just joining us on the program, she's the regional director for the Children's Home Society. You got a couple of nice comments in our Facebook section from Katie wilkes delegetti and Joe Kinzer, too, from the Berkeley County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Uh, and I guess they work with you on a regular basis when it comes to these situations. What is your relationship with them in terms of uh, how uh, these cases work out? So they, they are both. Um, Katie and Joe are great friends of Children's Home Society, um, particularly Victoria's House Child Advocacy Center. Um, you know, Katie and Joe are both um, very strong supporters of Children's Home Society, and of and they know what our children need, and they know the needs of, um, of our kids in foster care, as well as our kids that come through all of our programs, um, as well as the need of what child placing agencies have in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, we work with the prosecutor's office almost daily. I think there's daily contact that we have there. Um, you know, they are the uh, representation of DHS when they're filing these petitions. So they know all true well what the, the needs of our families are in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, when families are facing crisis that their children have to go out of their homes um, and go into a foster care home or into a kinship relative home, they know what is needed for our kids while their parents get their um, get the services that they need to get them back. Amy, we have a couple minutes left. Is there anything you needed to cover that you haven't had the chance to do yet? I think the only thing is, you know, it's really important whenever we go into the special session that we advocate for a 25% increase into the daily into the daily rates that we can provide child placing agencies. We what need, would that bring it to? What would that bring? I don't know what that would bring it to. Okay. I'm so sorry. I'm not prepared for that one. Um, I just know that that is, and I'm not a numbers person. I'm a social worker because math was really hard for me. I'll be completely transparent. Uh -huh. um, but we need that rate increase so that we can continue to provide these homes because if we cannot, then I'm not sure where our children will go. Um, and we are providing safe foster care homes as well as the other child placing um, agencies in the Eastern Panhandle and across the state. And we can't afford to lose any more. Um, we work con um, connected with the other child placing agencies. Children's Home Society is not the only one in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, but we need to, you know, we've come together to work together. We always have over the years. And this is a need that we all have right now that we're all facing. We can't afford to lose any other agencies. Is the situation getting worse? Are you guys holding the line or is it actually improving? Um, we're holding the line right now. And that that's just where we're at. We um, we're holding the line. And I think that some are struggling more than others. Amy, is there a way our listeners and viewers can learn more or even help out with the Children's Home Society? Yes, you can learn more by visiting our um, website, childhswv.org. Um, and if you would like to help us locally, we have a big fundraiser coming up uh, next Wednesday at Jersey Mike's. It is Jersey Mike's Day of Giving. 100% of their uh, proceeds come to us and will stay in the Eastern Panhandle. All you have to do is come out and grab lunch or dinner. Um, you can even order it and we'll deliver it to you. That's next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Jersey Mike's. Yes. You get the money. Exactly. We get it. Wow, well, let's go have lunch at Jersey Mike's next week. Thank you so much. Or dinner. Yeah, yeah, just stop by and have something. Amy, thanks for coming in. Thank you so much for having me.